record here and share the screen. So we get this going. And we'll do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In our mission statement, Kiwanis is one of the global organization of volunteers dedicated to saving the world one child of God and yet a dying service to others. Good. Thank you. Okay, we've got Caleb coming in. Invocation, John Cully. John, we can't hear you. It doesn't show that you're on mute, but we can't hear you at all. Barely. A little bit. No. Can't hear you at all. Eternal Father, we give you thanks for sunshine and the promise of spring. Pour out your blessings on this community that we may know and do your will. Strengthen us in service to you and keep us faithful in your service. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes, we've got Laura Gilliland here, who is the uh, from Crawfordsville, but she lives down south now in uh, in or New Orleans or somewhere in Louisiana, and uh, she's here visiting with us today and trying to bring us some new uh, membership. About that green thing. So, Laura, thank you. Thank you. And um, announcements. Uh, uh, as we said, the COVID uh, vaccine is now open to all of those over 50. So, uh, if you're if you're there, go get it. You know, it's uh, we want to try to make sure that everybody has that thing, and it would be very very good to get that get that going with everybody. Um, volunteer opportunities. March 12th, we're unloading the food truck at Nourish. We need three more people for that. Uh, by the way, I did mute you all. So if you've, uh, if you've got, if you want to talk, just hit off the mute so we can, uh, we can get that. But we do have the Nourish truck on March 12th at 9 a.m. Uh, March 15th, we're packing backpacks for Nourish. Uh, I think we've got enough people there. March 17th is the mobile food pantry. We still need nine more people for that. So we really need your help with the mobile food pantry. I, it's not going to be a big task. Uh, from what I understand, we're going to be do, do some checking in and uh, of people. And then we have uh, just, we'll have people with uh, by the tables. And when people drive up, we just throw it in the car, so it should be fairly easy. So we do need some people for that, though. Jerry, you need speaker coordinators, right? You're on mute, Jerry. Sorry about that. We've got April taken care of, um, and I think I've got one slot left in May, um, so I'll, I'll get that handled. I am still looking for five speakers for the month of July. So if, um, if you've got an idea about somebody who could speak, um, please uh, uh, email or call me with it. Um, I would need the, the speaker's name, their um, uh, contact information, phone number, email address, and if possible, the topic that they're, uh, they're going to speak on. Um, but um, if, um, if everybody would uh, you know, think up of one, we'll have more than we know what to do with. And, um, you know, that's a good place to be in. Thanks for those who have uh, helped out so far. Laura, thank you very much for, uh, for your help in getting the two 
international candidates uh, who will be speaking to us in um, in May. Jerry, thanks. Um, Chamber of Commerce, as we talked about before, we've become members through their uh, uh, help. We've become members with the Chamber of Commerce. They provided a free membership to us this year. So we've got a web page there and they're doing some advertising for us regarding Pancake Week. We also have the opportunity to use their meeting rooms. I'm going to look at the meeting rooms tomorrow. Um, uh, how many would be willing to meet in person uh, it, during March? One, two, three, keep your hands up so I can see four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if we can if we can do that, we will try to schedule a uh, uh, an in-person meeting um, in March sometime. We've already decided we are going to hold the board meeting uh, there in March. They do have one room that'll hold up to 50 people and uh, be adequate to be everybody be social distanced and we can do food there. You're talking about March or April because you said you're going to have the board meeting in March. No, I board meeting in April. I'm sorry. The uh, the other ones were were uh, March. We we'll have to be careful because some of the speakers are saying are doing it because they're on Zoom. Yeah, we'll look we'll look at it and and figure out what we can do. Hi, Litany. It's great to have you aboard here. Hi. We don't see your we don't see your smiling face, but we can hear you now. Yeah, you don't want to see the face. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, just an op-ed here. Um, I'm not sure how prudent it would be to do it in March, um, a face-to-face -face meeting. I, my personal opinion would be to give it another 30 days and maybe look at doing it sometime in, um, in April. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And I think by then, uh, a good amount of people will have been uh, gotten both shots. Exactly. And, uh, I think I think March might be might be rushing it a little bit. Okay. Okay. We'll look at April. Um, how many of you have held office in our club at one point or another? Okay. We are looking, as we said, for a treasurer. And those of you that have not held office um or those of you that have uh we would like we we've got to have a treasurer and we've got to get this thing cooking right uh sharon is going to be retiring from doing that position and without these positions being full um we we can't be a club we can't just be a social club we've got to do all the other things that we need to do to remain a club so uh, I need your help. We need your help. Caleb will be president in October and he definitely needs your help. So uh, we need to really work on this to, to get this position full. So uh, I've called probably 30 people and uh, got negative responses from most all. Um, even if we have to go outside, let's bring that person in as a new member. And, and uh, you know, we'll make them a treasurer right away. Uh, we have to do something to get these, these uh, positions full. Okay, so get with me and, and let's get this done, please. Um, We also have asked uh, every member to consider whatever they would have paid for meals during our uh, meetings to contribute that to the club. Um, we're still meeting, but as far as our commitments for monetary support um, and our fundraising has fallen behind. So we need to, we need to keep that up. Uh, checks can be made to Crawfordsville, uh, Kiwanis and sent to the post office box um, for that. 
So we really need we really need your help in in supporting that um, uh, monetary funds so we can keep keep going here. Member updates. Uh, anybody get any of the any updates from anybody this week? I haven't talked to the ones from last week. I know Dave Polly was still still recuperating and. Uh, Robin Pebworth is supposed to be getting his computer to, to be able to get online and, and be online. So we're hoping that that can be done. Anybody else get any updates from anybody? Nope. Okay. Uh, pancake week. Um, we, as you know, we're planning pancake week in March, uh, March 29th to April 3rd. So we've got tickets here. We will be distributing the tickets to your home uh, or business this either this weekend or early next week. So we will have them for everybody. The tickets, a uh, packet of tickets has 15 tickets, which is uh, $90. We expect that everyone would purchase a packet to either and sell them uh, or give them away. Um, but the tickets will be out this week. Uh, happy bucks quarter two is Riley hospital. Um, so who's happy here today? Okay. Got to hit, hit off of mute. <laughs> Nobody's happy. I guess I turned everybody down here for, for this Dennis. I'll be happy. Purdue's still winning and the sun's out. What could be better? Great. Great. Laura? I'm happy that Mike Bishop is joining. It's five o'clock somewhere. He's a graduate with me from Crawfordsville High School. And uh, I'm trying to get two new members for your club that that also graduated with me that played football and we were undefeated in 1968-1969. So uh, hopefully if I get these two, you'll get the rest of the team. Good, good. That'd be great. So I'm going to donate $5 and I'll send it to you, Gary. Thank you, Laura. Who else? I'll throw in five for, uh, for Riley. And uh, I agree with Dennis. It's nice to see the sunshine, even though it's kind of cool. And... Um, the kitchen's back together again, so that's a um, that's a good thing. Uh, the range and dishwasher installed. We're still waiting on the uh, refrigerator, but uh, it's nice to have the uh, new appliances. Good. You should be happy. Jim? I'm happy. Uh, been out doing a little work in the garden all these nice days, and and I used to losing. Good. Good. And pardon me. Yeah, we're we're happy. Um, we spent the weekend with two of my grandkids uh, uh, that came over here and, and with uh, their mom and dad. I say that the grandkids came over, but of course, mom and dad came with, <laughs> but they spent the weekend with us. And then uh, yesterday we saw two of the other, the, the other two grandkids. So uh, yeah. it was a great time. And my, my uh, three-year-old, uh, who visited over the weekend, he called here last night because he, not to talk to grandpa or Graham, but yeah. to see the kittens. He wanted, he called with on the video phone because he wanted to see the kittens again. <laughs> he played with them all weekend. So we're definitely happy and we'll, we'll do 10 bucks for that. So anybody else happy? We've got a fellow at church who, uh, who had a pretty rough time. Old Byron knows him, but he keep getting really good news each each day. So I'm glad that he's back home and and uh, with the family and and recovering. So I'll I'll throw in ten for that. Good. Okay. All of this, like it says, all of this is for Riley this this month or this quarter. So I've got uh, five dollars. Uh, I'm happy to see Laura Gillen. She may not remember me. Uh, Larry Saylor from Newmarket. 
I, and, did, I said hello to you, Larry. I know uh, you're a Facebook friend of mine and an old friend from 60 years ago. Yeah, I know that far back. Uh, I heard Gracie in the background. Uh, Winston's, right, Winston's right beside me taking a nap. So he's here at the meeting. So good to see you. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, we always mark Winston down as an attendee. <laughs> you know, he doesn't pay his dues, but, you know, we try. Yeah, he has his adventure page on Facebook. That's right. That's right. So, okay, anybody else? Yes. Gary? Byron. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in five bucks uh, for Riley. My uh, son-in-law, Josh Fowler, some of you might know him. He works for Cook's Heating and Cooling, and he's spent about two and a half weeks in St. Vincent's Hospital with a bacterial infection of the brain and the lung. Mm -hmm. And... And so he's home recuperating because of all the pressure, he lost some mobility on his right side of his body and his speech. So he's learning that all back again. So, but he's, he's making some progress. So we're thankful. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. I had to attend a, uh, uh, service for my, uh, 58 year old cousin up at one of, one of the, one of my cousins up in Chicago who had passed uh, from COVID after 103 days in the hospital. So it was a very, very rough time for her and the family. And, and uh, we did have to uh, have to visit with, visit with the family and everything. And it's a tough time to do it. So anybody else happy? Hi, Morris, this is five bucks for Riley. Thanks, My granddaughter Morris. took us out for dinner last night at we were on Steak House, and we we're going next Wednesday night at uh, Suki's at Garden Down. Oh, good. Good. Helping the local economy, right? Thanks, Morris. We appreciate it. Okay. And again, like I said, all that goes to uh, Riley this quarter. So very, very happy with that. Um, this day in history, uh, and, you know, it was interesting. You hear the news this morning, and, and, uh, looked at it but march 4th i didn't realize this was the original inauguration day from the date that george washington was inaugurated all the way till 1937 when it was changed to january 20th uh through the 20th amendment uh it had, the reason it had been march 4th is what because uh, that was the date that congress normally went back to work so uh very interesting and and you I don't know if you saw the news today, but there was potential for protests and everything because of this being the, what some people are saying, the real inauguration day. Um, 1628 on this day, England's King Charles I grants a royal charter to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. In 1681 on this day, English Quaker William Penn receives a charter from Charles II, making him the sole proprietor of Pennsylvania. And uh, 1837, Chicago becomes incorporated as a city. So it's Chicago's birthday. 1918, on this day, the first cases of the Spanish flu um, happened in, in uh, Texas. In 1927, Babe Ruth becomes the highest paid player in the MLB, signing a three-year $70,000 per season contract with the New York Yankees. So that's uh, that was quite interesting to hear that, $70,000. Um, somebody asked about the food pantry. The food pantry uh, uh, distribution is March 17th, and the... Um, uh, packing at Nourish is March 15th. So hopefully that gives you the information needed. National Days, today's Benjamin Harrison Day. Uh, today's Hug a GI Day. So all of you uh, veterans, uh, and today's March 4th, Do Something Day. March 4th, Do Something Day. National, oh, you're trying to get me to do something? Yeah, uh -huh. National uh, Pound Cake Day, National Snack Day, 
uh, and World Book Day. Birthdays, 1888, Newt Rockney uh, was born. 1954, Peter Jacobson, American golfer. And 1969, Chaz Bono, son and Cher's kid, was born in Los Angeles. Kiwanian birthdays, uh, none this week. So we got to wait till next week and see who we have. So Jim, you want to introduce your uh, guest? You're, everybody's on mute, so you'd have to uh, uh, unmute. And, um, and Jeff, you'll have to do the same, please. There we go. Okay. Uh, you'll also have to share screen with him at some point. Already got that done. He's, uh, he's made a co-host. Okay. Jeff uh, Dukes uh, directs the Purdue Climate Change Research Center and is a professor in Purdue's Uni Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and Biological Sciences. He holds the Belcher Chair of Environmental Sustainability in the College of Agriculture. Dr. Duke's research examines plants and ecosystems responding to changing environments, focusing on topics from invasive species to climate change. Dr. Duke received his PhD from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree from Brown University, both in environmental uh, biological sciences. As director of the Purdue Climate Change Research Center, he has led the Indiana Climate Change Impact Assessment. And Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. That's great, I appreciate the introduction and uh, nice to be with you all today. I hope you can hear me okay. If you give me a thumbs up, if uh, that's is, all right, that's great, thank you. And I'm just gonna move some things around on my screen so I can see what I'm talking about and, and maybe see some of you as well at the, at the same time approximately. Uh, there's always that Zoom presentation adjustment time. Here we go. All right, this is terrific. It saved me the, the drive down there, although I don't get to see beautiful Crawfordsville today on a, on a nice sunny day, but, but it's, uh, it's nice to be able to talk to you all in person. And I, I guess Jerry wouldn't have been there anyway because he's out in space somewhere, which is pretty cool. Um, love, that, love that background. Um, so today, uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk about climate change. I'm gonna talk about some of the latest information uh, that we have on, on climate change. And I'm happy to take questions. If you wanna um, put a question in the chat while I'm going, that's, that's fine. Um, basically, I'm gonna talk about uh, why the climate's changing and how we're gonna solve that issue and, and give you a lot of really sort of up-to-date information on this, things that have come out in the last um, year or the last weeks in some case on, on this topic. Um, so I want to put this in, a, in the context of um, the sort of the big picture, um, longer periods of time here. So if we look out over the last, say, 10,000 years or so, um, recent research has sort of updated our understanding of, of the climate over that time period. Not, it hasn't changed it dramatically, but, but changed it a little bit. We used to think that the um, well, we used to have sort of reconstructions of, of past climates from um, things like uh, ice cores and, and tree rings that suggested that Earth's climate had, was, was sort of cooling off uh, recently along this, uh, this blue line that's, that's shown here, whereas our, our simulations, our, our models of, of how the climate should have changed were shown in, in gray here. Um, recently, the reconstructions got... Um, basically some additional information added to them that, that, uh, that made them what we think is more accurate. And now it suggests that the past climate has been sort of along this red line here. And what's really important here, it's not so much which line we're going along, but it's that there really hasn't been much fluctuation in climate over the last um, 10,000 years or so. And, and this is just this SST anomaly here um, really is, is basically a good index of, of what the um, surface temperature of Earth has been doing over time. The anomaly just means the difference from some um, reference period. And, and so um, if you look at the climate, you know, this is basically saying look at the, looking at the global temperature relative to um, a, a period of a couple hundred years ago here. Um, uh, anyway, the, this stable climate that, that 
the planet has had over the last 10,000 years has allowed us to, as a society, as a species, really to, to develop agriculture um, in the way that we understand it today. And, and yes, Gary, I'm talking just about temperature here, but we can imagine a lot of things would, would go along with temperature at this, at this point. I'll talk about other aspects of climate soon. Um, so agriculture, uh, you know, got started sort of in, in fits and starts. It didn't obviously look like what we know it to be today um, until very recently. But, um, you know, we started cultivating species over this time and figuring out how to plant them out in, in different locations. And, and that was able to happen because we, you know, benefited from a, a pretty stable climate. There haven't been a lot of, um, well, basically the, the uh, Earth's orbit has been in a in a phase where it's it's kept the climate pretty pretty stable, and there have not been a lot of major disruptions recently. Um, that's been a big benefit. But more recently, if you looked at the end of that that uh, time series on the last graph, we can zoom into it here. Uh, more recently, the the stable climate that we have had is is being disrupted at sort of unprecedented scale or unprecedented pace since we've had you know people living in the numbers that we have in this, the, um, the way we have on the, on the surface of the planet here. So um, here you're seeing recent um, average temperatures. And um, this is relative to a reference period again. So um, in this case, the reference period is 1850 to 1899. And I'm showing you the global average temperature, the average temperature over land and the average temperature over the ocean. And so I want you to see basically two things here. One is that temperature has been increasing rapidly relative to um, those past changes, and particularly over the last few decades. And then second, I want you to see that where we live on land, the temperature has been increasing much faster than it has over the ocean. So when we look at global temperature increases, since the ocean is two thirds of the globe, they, those increases look smaller than, than what people on average have felt because those increases are happening fastest over land and really they're happening fastest um, in the um, high end of the nor northern hemisphere really over over uh, Alaska, Siberia, things like that. That's where climate's really changing fast or the temperature's really rising fast right now. So why is this happening? What's actually disrupting our climate? Well, um, we have understood for since before Purdue was founded, you know, more than 150 years ago, we've understood that some gases are able to trap heat. That is when, when infrared radiation goes through them, some gases are able to absorb that and they actually warm up. And, and so when those gases are in our atmosphere, they act like blankets. They take the infrared radiation that would otherwise go back to cold space and they actually warm up instead like a blanket would over you at night. And that radiates some of that heat back down and keeps us warm here on the surface of the planet. And we've been increasing the concentration of several heat trapping gases in our atmosphere because of human activities that have been ramping up increasingly over recent decades and centuries, but particularly recent decades. Um, and um, so it is consistent with the recent warming we've been seeing that those gases would be responsible for it. And so we can look here at the, the one that has been um, released more than any other um, and had, should be having the strongest effects according to the physics and basically atmospheric chemistry of gases. Uh, and that's carbon dioxide. And, and if we superimpose the graph of the um, temperature that we saw in the last graph, which is in, in black, was in black in that graph and is in black in this graph, um, if we superimpose that global average temperature um, over a graph of the carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere over time, we see that there's a pretty amazing match. Um, and obviously just because the two lines fit together doesn't mean that one is causing the other, but we know and have known for a long time that, that CO2 is an important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Um, and we have several lines of evidence now that that this is in fact the dominant cause of the, the change in climate that we're seeing. Um, and so we can, we can look at those lines of evidence in different ways, but one way is to put the, um, basically to put this information in models, all of our sort of understanding of, um, of the physics of these gases and the um, various atmosphere and ocean processes that are, um, and land processes that are important for climate, as well as the things like the um, strength of the sun. Um, we can put all this into 
uh, models and try to understand whether those models can actually accurately replicate what's what we're seeing, what we're observing. And um, the upshot of this is that uh, this has been done many times and people cannot replicate the warming in temperatures in the, in the observations that we see here in the black line if you only use the natural, what we call forcings or the natural factors that, that affect climate. Um, if you add in the human factors as well as the natural factors, then you can actually represent what has happened to our climate quite well. And just to be clear, when we add in these factors in the blue line here, we're adding in the greenhouse gases that, that act to warm the planet. We're also adding in aerosols that are emitted when we do things like burn coal. These little tiny particles up in the atmosphere reflect uh, the sun's light back into space. And so they actually act to cool the planet. So, um, so there's a, a balance of things that we're doing that, that warm and cool the planet. You have to include those to be able to get the sort of to, to get the numbers right on on replicating the past, on being able to simulate it correctly. So this is one, one of the many lines of evidence that, that we're the ones who are changing the climate. And it's clear that climate change is not good um, for a variety of reasons here. And, and the most important reason might be different depending on where in the world you are, right? So if you're uh, right on the coast, if you're in Southern Florida, then maybe you're pretty concerned about hurricanes and sea level rise. Um, those are, immediate threats as, as hurricanes get wetter and, and more powerful and um, and as the sea level rise threatens your potentially your property if you're you know low-lying property in Tampa or something um, other parts of the world there are different threats could be wildfires so in the red parts of the map here you see areas where wildfires are judged to be the the biggest risk to uh, to people and that's the increasing risk from wildfires because hotter temperatures end up drying out uh, fuel faster um, and uh, making it more flammable. And um, that contributes to larger wildfires essentially over time. And, you know, not necessarily more wildfires, but once one gets started, it'll burn faster and farther. Um, but if you get longer dry periods, that, that make, creates a risk for more wildfires as well. So because we are um, releasing this, the, these greenhouse gases that are contributing the majority of, um, uh, well, are the, really the, the factor causing 100% of the, of the climate change that, that we're seeing or more, um, that, you know, that then our future depends on our own actions. And one way of looking at this that sort of is, puts it in local context is to <clears throat> take a look at, at projections for changes in climate by the end of this century um, right here at home, or in this case, the example is Marion County, uh, Indiana, so near home. Um, so this is, you know, where Indianapolis is, of course, and, and the, historically um, in Indy, they have, they have had about four days per year on average where the high temperature breaks 95 degrees. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, and so that's that's the climate that people have expected. That's the climate everything has been built for. Um, but if we look at how that's ex expected to change in the future, um, a little bit of average temperature increase ends up um, creating a big increase in the um, incidences of extremes like this. And so we expect that this decade that's going to rise to uh, about fifteen days per. Um, per year where we break 95 degrees. And by mid-century, we could be seeing a month or so. And by late century, we could be seeing, you know, well over a month and potentially something like two and a half months. But, but what you see here is there, there are two scenarios. There's a medium scenario and a high emission scenario. In the medium emission scenario, that's basically means that a lot of countries are working to minimize emissions or, or somehow technological breakthroughs make it so cheap that um, everybody wants to switch the way that they um, generate electricity and various behaviors change in a way that, that we minimize emissions. The high emission scenario I think is, is sort of a worst case scenario and I think it's really unlikely to happen. Medium emission scenario, we might, we might um, get there or even potentially be a little better than that. But, um, <clears throat> the high emission scenario would mean depending on coal sort of globally for um, and potentially increasingly 
over the course of this century. So hopefully we don't get there because I don't think any of us want two and a half days, sorry, two and a half months of 95 degree plus days in Indianapolis by the end of the century. <clears throat> Whether or not we live to see it, that's not what we wanna sort of give to our next generations. So where do these emissions come from? Um, there are two primary sources. So one is, and the, the dominant source is energy generation. We burn fossil fuels to, to generate energy that we do various things with. Um, and I'll show you this sort of in detail in, in a minute. The other sort of large source is agriculture. There are various activities that we do in agriculture that lead to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and one of those associated activities, particularly in the tropics, is we convert land to agriculture. We take forests typically and um, cut them down, burn them, uh, the carbon that was in the trees and potentially some of the carbon that was in the soils goes back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and, and methane. And then we start farming that land, whether we're grazing it or putting it in soybeans or into an oil palm plantation. Um, you know, there are a variety of things that happen, but, but a lot of that carbon has gone up to the atmosphere. So here is where um, global emissions come from in, in a bit more detail. And uh, if you don't like figures like this, then I'm really sorry, because you're going to see a few more of them. I love figures like this. Um, this is called a, a Sankey chart. And, and it, it basically gives you a sense of, um, you know, where, well, the, the flow of things like energy and where they come from. So let's start at the right of the right hand side of this graph and I'll explain it to you. So here we're seeing gases that are emitted from different activities and the width of the arrow on the on the right hand side here corresponds to how much of the climate changing um, activity or, or sort of action physics in the atmosphere is coming from that gas being emitted. So three quarters of the change in climate that we're getting right now from our activities is coming from releasing carbon dioxide. And then, you know, less is coming from, from methane and nitrous oxide, and then some, some other gases that are mostly used as refrigerants. Um, so if we trace back the carbon dioxide, for instance, we can see the activities that lead to its generation here. And then before that, the sectors that, that end up generating that CO2. And so you see that you know, a lot of this, um, these emissions are coming from generating electricity and heat, but then also transportation and, and a variety of other sectors. And, and agriculture is down here in the, in the purple. Um, these are sort of direct emissions from agriculture in purple, a lot of it from livestock and manure, and a lot of it from, from soils as well, generating nitrous oxide. Um, and then the, the cutting down forests uh, part is sort of in, in green here. All right, so, so many different um, sources of uh, climate changing emissions. Um, if we look in the US at where our energy comes from, sort of take that, that big energy section, um, we see that, that if we trace it back, the energy that we use in the building sector, the industry, um, and, and for transportation, um, we see a, there's a lot of energy coming from natural gas in the US, a bit coming from coal, and that's been declining rapidly. Some nuclear here, a lot of energy coming from petroleum, so oil, um, the, and most of that's going towards transportation when we burn it as um, gas or diesel in our cars and trucks or kerosene in our planes. Um, so uh, then if we're looking for sort of renewable energy, well, it's a pretty tiny fraction uh, of the total right up here. You'd, you'd be excused for missing that at first. Um, so if we want to, if we actually want to stop climate change, the challenge is that we have to take these graphs and basically squish them down to nothing, right? We have to figure out how do you take the coal, natural gas, and petroleum part of this graph and just collapse them to nothing? Or in this, in the previous graph, um, you know, how do you basically collapse this whole thing to nothing? How do you replace all of these processes? It's not a simple task. Um, so this is going to be a massive societal effort, and obviously it's global because the atmosphere is well mixed. It's not like our emissions in Indiana are the only ones that are changing the atmosphere, but our emissions in Indiana contribute to this. So how could we even think about this as, as a way to address it? Well, 
one way that I like to think about it is breaking down the emissions into like four different boxes, into, into like an equation that, that has four different ways you can control the, the total of emissions. Um, and, and so you can break it down this way. The total emissions that we produce globally are a product. So we'll multiply these things together. They're a product of the population. How many people are there on earth? Because each of us has some sort of carbon footprint, right? Everything I do, I turn on the computer to give this talk. I'm generating, I'm, I'm using electricity. It's sort of contributing eventually to emissions. Um, we all have a footprint. So population times consumption, like how much stuff do we do? How much travel do we do? How many things do we buy? Um, all the, or many of the things that we do are consumption related, they lead to emissions. Um, then we multiply that by efficiency. So of all these different things we do, how much energy does it take to, to provide those things that we're, that we're doing or consuming? Like for instance, I could um, drive out to, I don't know, uh, go surfing in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and I could do that. I, I could throw my surfboard in the back of a, a semi truck, right? And drive it out there. Or I could maybe I don't know get an electric bike and and like strap it on my back. That would be crazy. But uh, you know take an electric uh, take an electric motorcycle or something out there. Um, either way, I'm getting to the coast and surfing. I hope if I don't die. But um, but the the motorcycle, the electric motorcycle, would use so much less energy. We way more efficient than throwing my surfboard in the back of a semi, right? So, so there are different ways we can get the same end product. Um, and, and then the last part of this equation is greenhouse gas intensity. And greenhouse gas intensity just means how much greenhouse gas is released or how much heat trapping gas is released to produce the energy that you use. So, you know, if, um, if the electric motorcycle that I was driving across the country was charged up with energy from solar panels, there'd be virtually no emissions. If it was charged up with energy from coal-fired power plants, there'd be a lot more emissions, right? And so, so that's, that's what that term means. So the point is that each of these different things provides opportunities to reduce emissions. And some of them are better than others. Some of them are easier than others. Like, I don't think any of us really wants to reduce population in lots of ways, like with a pandemic, that's not a good way to do this. But there are good ways to reduce population growth. And one of those is, you know, bettering the, the quality of life for girls in the developing world, right? If you, if you um, provide them with a more secure quality of life, if you educate girls and show them that they have sort of opportunities to support themselves as they grow up, then they're likely to have many fewer children and that's gonna slow population growth. So, you know, I don't think there's, well, it's in some places it's controversial, but I think like here, there's not any controversy in the idea of educating girls being a good thing, right? So there's opportunities in population. There's ways you don't wanna control population. Um, with consumption, you know, that's sort of a potentially controversial one too. Like, I don't want to not be able to travel at all. And I don't want to not buy a computer or buy the food that I want, right? There are certainly ways I can reduce my consumption that I won't really notice the difference. But um, we all want certain things. Um, and, and so that's a little bit of a tricky one. But fortunately, this whole equation is a product of, of four different things. So we can reduce consumption, that'll, that'll help. We can also get more efficient, that helps, right? And, and if, if you're more efficient doing things, you're basically getting the same stuff, but you're saving money. So that's typically a, you know, a, a positive. And then if, if we get our energy from um, sources that don't emit greenhouse gases, I don't know that we really care about that. Um, if it's the same, you know, number of electrons essentially flowing through our devices, then uh, great, they still work, right? So, so there's one where if we can reduce that last term to zero, fantastic, right? We all benefit, there's no sacrifice essentially. So there's different consequences of all these four different methods. Another thing we can try to do is recapture emissions from the atmosphere, suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere basically. 
And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, there are ways to do it that are not super expensive, but a lot of the ways to do it in big quantities are really expensive. And so it's not that, it, it's definitely not something we can rely on yet as, a, as some sort of solution. Okay, so the good news here is that there are new technologies that are making these challenges easier and cheaper to solve. And um, there are, well, I'm gonna be talking a lot about these different developments, but there's developments in energy and energy generation, the cost of, of generating carbon-free energy or clean energy, really. Um, there's developments in efficiency that I'll touch on briefly where um, you know, we can do things, the same things for, for cheaper. Um, there are developments in carbon capture, new technologies that are bringing down the cost of carbon capture, although it's still not super cheap. I'll touch on that a little bit at the very end here. And then there's also improvements in farming practices that will reduce agricultural emissions. Although, you know, these last two bullets, the farming practices and the carbon capture developments, there are, those are much more, I would say, incremental than the developments in the first two bullet points. So some of these, um, some of these sectors are going to be tougher to, to sort of crush down to, to zero emissions than others. Okay, so now for some, some really good news. I don't know if you know this, I don't know if you've heard about this, but um, the cost of generating renewable energy has plummeted over the last decade or so. Um, and and it's, um, it's really just staggering. I mean, I am actually um, old enough to remember when Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the White House and you know people had different opinions about that. But at that time, electricity, at least, generated from solar panels was incredibly expensive. It was probably hundreds of times more expensive than it is today. In the last 10 years, or maybe 12 years, the price of electricity um, generated by utility scale, that is large scale, um, sort of installations of photovoltaic panels, these PVs, um, has dropped by like 90%. And uh, I mean, that's unheard of, right? And at the same time, the price of energy generated by wind, and in both of these cases, this is the price of the, the resource over the lifetime of a, a generating plant. Um, the, the price of wind has dropped by, you know, two thirds or more as well. And so uh, now renewable energy is actually cheaper than any other form of energy in most parts of uh, the developed world. Um, and I would argue that probably in most parts of the developing world too, but, um, but analyses show this. And, and, um, and, and nuclear is unfortunately more expensive than gas or coal to, to generate. So, so renewables are actually the cheapest form of energy now um, in you know, many, many places. And that's why you see them spreading across the, you see renewables spreading across the landscape as I'll show you in just a minute. But there are some barriers to renewables um, spread. One is that there are plenty of entrenched interests associated with the energy infrastructure that we already have in place that are lobbying hard to slow the adoption of renewables because you know less business is bad business essentially if you're in the mining industry or if you're in the um, you know position where burning fossil fuels is making you money in some way um, you're not interested in seeing your business go away and so these interests have a lot of money because we use so much energy um, and they have been throwing that energy that that money at um, finding ways to slow down this transition. Um, and they've been doing that for decades now. So this transition is happening much more slowly than it might in the absence of um, this sort of political lobbying. Um, and then the second challenge is that of course, renewables are variable in how much energy they provide. Uh, solar panels are typically gonna provide less energy at nine in the morning than they do at one in the afternoon. Um, and so, and they're certainly going to provide more energy at one in the afternoon than they do at midnight, right? Um, maybe not in Alaska on the solstice or something on the, on the summer solstice, but, but basically, um, you know, they, they are variable and can be intermittent too. And so, so how do you 
um, make up for that, you know. Uh, well, you could connect the grid better so that where the sun's shining, it's, they can send energy to where the sun's shining less. Um, that's one way. Another thing is you could do more storage. You could you could store things in batteries. But the the problem is batteries are are pretty expensive, um, and so it's not it hasn't been really viable to to make up for this challenge with with more battery storage. But there's good news on that front too. And so that is that battery prices are coming way down and they're coming down really quickly. Um, so here you see a similar drop in prices of batteries, um, or the cost of battery storage over recent years here, over the last eight years or so, as we've seen in things like solar power. So this is becoming more and more affordable. So this is actually a reasonable um, path going forward for um, increasing the fraction of our of our energy that comes from renewables. And you can see that that's happening. Here is the spread of utility scale solar projects with these photovoltaic panels across the landscape going from uh, 2007 or so through uh, 2019. You can see how these projects have just been proliferating across the landscape, particularly in the redder areas of the map where there's more energy, there's more solar energy to be harvested, but not just there. It's happening in Indiana too. You see it happening in Minnesota. There are state level variations, but, um, but basically this is economic power um, in many, many places at this point. And, and the thing that's holding it back is, is um, typically politics at this point, really. Um, so we're seeing rapid changes, and I expect that those changes are going to continue going forward. Um, we're also seeing rapid changes in efficiency. So in buildings, for instance, we're seeing people using more and more LED lights. Well, those lights provide just as good um, light as, as any other light, um, but they use a fifth to a sixth as much power um, as an old incandescent bulb that you might have purchased because they don't heat up and waste that energy like, as heat like the, the older bulbs do. We're seeing better insulation being put in, in buildings and developments on that front. We're seeing increasingly um, people moving towards using heat pumps, which are much more efficient for heating and cooling buildings than the sort of traditional air conditioners and, and HVAC systems, uh, the furnaces. Um, the challenge is they still cost more upfront, but they end up providing a more sort of even heat and, and over the long term, they're, they're cheaper to operate. Um, and the good news with heat pumps is they can be, you know, they use electricity. And so if your electrical system is clean, then not only are you getting efficient energy use through the heat pumps, but you're also not necessarily going to be emitting greenhouse gases the way you would if you were burning natural gas, for instance, in your furnace. Um, and then we're also seeing tremendous developments in electric vehicles that, um, that increase efficiency as well. I'll talk more about that in just a minute. I'll say that some things are gonna be much harder to change like um, industry and agriculture, figuring out how to produce steel um, and at large scale um, or cement at large scale um, uh, without releasing greenhouse gases directly or indirectly. That's more of a challenge. It's not impossible for sure, but it's more of a challenge than some of these other things. Um, agriculture is also difficult. It's, you know, we want to fertilize our fields so that we can grow more plants and get better yield. Um, the timing, the form of fertilizer, exactly how we do that can control how much nitrous oxide gets released by those fields. So these sorts of things are really important to, um, to, to try to manage and we need to figure out sort of big scale solutions. So uh, I mentioned electric vehicles. I want to get back to them for, for just a minute. Um, electric vehicles are um, actually not just sort of different in sort of the, the amount of energy. Well, maybe they, I'll just say they are. They're, they're much more energy efficient than, than um, vehicles that, that burn gasoline or, or diesel. If you look at the actual amount of energy that's consumed to go a mile, um, there's just much, much less energy involved. And there we go. Um, so if you look at the most efficient vehicle on the market today for that's a gasoline burning vehicle, it's probably the, the Toyota Prius <clears throat> Eco version. That gets 56 miles to the gallon. Um, and, you know, it's a good car. It's an efficient car, um, probably twice as efficient as most of the sedans on the road. Um, 
but it absolutely gets blown out of the water by the efficiency of electric vehicles. So if you look at the, the Nissan Leaf, you know, as opposed to getting 56 miles to the gallon, the Nissan Leaf gets the equivalent of 108 miles per gallon. So almost, you know, twice as efficient as, as the, the Prius. You look at the Hyundai Ionic, it's 133 miles per gallon equivalent. The, the Tesla Model 3 is 134 miles per gallon equivalent. So these are, first of all, incredibly efficient in terms of the amount of energy they need to move people down the road. It doesn't mean they're bad cars. These are actually typically safer cars because they're really heavy with the battery and they're, they're super stable with the batteries on the sort of the bottom of the car under people's feet. Um, uh, that makes the car super stable and, and heavy. So if it's in a crash, it's not gonna get sort of flipped off the road easily. Um, but, and, and super fast to accelerate with these electric motors that have a lot of torque, um, but really efficient because they're recapturing energy whenever they slow down or break, just putting it back in the batteries. Um, and they're not generating a whole bunch of heat under the hood at the same time by blowing things up. They're just using all that energy uh, to move. Um, so if you, you know, if we switch to more efficient vehicles and we power these vehicles with um, clean electricity, then that's a, that's a win for the climate. So again, our energy use today looks like this. There's a lot of our energy coming from petroleum and natural gas and coal, very small fraction from, from renewables. Um, you can argue either way about whether biomass should be considered as renewable and its implications for the climate. I'm not gonna go into that in detail. I don't have time, but, but here's a vision for um, in a, just a recent paper that came out a couple of weeks ago for, for what our energy use could look like in the US by 2050 to replace the, the fossil fuels, how if we were sort of a, a being a climate friendly country that not was not affecting the, the climate with all of our activities, this is what that could look like. Um, a lot of energy going to electricity generation that provided our needs, that energy coming primarily from solar and wind, a little bit of hydrogen, um, some additional energy coming from from biomass, um, a lot of that going towards um, towards industrial needs. Um, we'd be using electricity to produce hydrogen and turn that into various liquid fuels that could be used in our transportation sector for the portion of our transportation sector that's difficult to electrify. Um, you know, we. Uh, we have a, a different system. We'd be this would require a lot of changes, but those changes are already underway, and it's just sort of a matter of, of how fast they happen. So there are visions where this is possible using current technologies that we already have. Um, I'll note that this there's there's no nuclear here. Um, I'm not saying there's there's not a path to nuclear. This isn't my figure. First of all, it's not my graph, but but I'm not saying there's not a not a place for nuclear in the future. But but right now it's it's just way too expensive. It's not cost competitive with any of these other energy sources. So it's not really part of the conversation with any of the current technologies we have. Um, so what could the future look like? Well, this is one of my last um, trips before COVID happened. I uh, was coming back from a meeting in California and I looked out the window of the uh, plane I was sitting in and, and this is what I saw um, out the window. And, and this to me looks like a possible sort of microcosm of our future. So if you zoom in on this, you see this is a solar installation that must be just going in because they haven't even put the panels in and part of it yet. Uh, but here's a big solar installer, part of a big solar installation. And then if you look closely, you can also see that there's wind energy being generated here, these lines of wind turbines. And I think that this is all combined. And I, you know, obviously I wasn't on the ground to know this, but I think that this is all being combined with some sort of um, animal feeding operation, or animal raising operation. I think that these are sheds where, uh, where we've got sort of a combined animal feeding op or, or confined animal feeding operation going on. These are probably the, the, waste lagoons next to each of these, um, or one of these is at least, I would guess. Um, so we've got a new kind of farming here going on in the southeastern, or sorry, southwestern Utah desert, where um, you, know, you wouldn't be able to farm in a conventional way, but you can farm a lot of energy from the wind and from the sun. Um, so this is a possible sort of future vision for what our, some parts of our country may look like to provide the energy we need. Um, there are a bunch of different technologies that we can use for, for taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this, 
this slide sort of lists several of them. There, there's legislation potentially going through the Indiana State House right now that would make it easier for people to get compensated by companies that want to offset their emissions um, by uh, incentivizing better farming practices that store more soil carbon or that, that incentivize storing carbon in forests that might otherwise be harvested. Um, you know, these sorts of things may become easier in the future and maybe there are likely to be more and more incentives that push us to store more carbon with these sort of natural solutions. I think we're, we're still a long way from the technology being economical or affordable for, for some of these other solutions, but there's a lot of research happening on them as well. And I don't have time to go into them today, unfortunately, but if there's time for questions, I'm happy for you to, um, to ask. Um, oh, I see Mark asked about the graph depicting energy costs. Um, to my understanding, there was not any government subsidy included in, um, in those costs. And, and I assume that, I mean, it, those are calculating costs over the lifetime of a plant. So I assume that any maintenance mm -hmm. that has to be done on the plant during its lifetime is included, but like replacing um, the panels wholesale for a new generation, that would not be included in that. Um, so, uh, just to sum up, um, what is each of our roles in improving the future? If, if, we, uh, if we think about our lives, it, there's, it's sort of stunning. Um, we have lived in the, the golden era of fossil fuels. Um, we, our lives have benefited tremendously from um, the fossil fuels that, that society has been burning during this time, and, and we continue to benefit from them. Um, but clearly, that's going to have to change if we're going to pass on a, a stable climate to future generations. Um, and for economic reasons, it looks like there's going to be a lot of benefits for, for changing that as well. So um, for me, uh, about 75% of all of the emissions from fossil fuels that, that have been changing our climate, 75% of all emissions that have happened in the history of our species have happened during my lifetime. Um, if you're 85, it's about 90% of all those emissions have happened in your lifetime. So it's, it's, it's kind of stunning to think about that, that this is like, that's, this is in a way what sort of has defined our lives. Um, but then, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to transition to what needs to happen to avoid um, climate disruption that's, that is truly disruptive to societies and, um, and, and the planet as we know it? Um, do we have roles on our own? I think there's, there's lots of different ways that we can try to address this individually, and, and I don't have time to go into them all now. But, you know, a simple way to start dealing with this problem is if it's important to you, just start talking about it. Uh, most people don't talk about climate change very often. And, um, you know, that means that the, the things we don't talk about really just often don't get dealt with. Um, talking about this, learning about this, um, thinking about what policies might or might not be realistic bridges to, to the future. Um, I think all that's really important. I'm happy to talk more with you about, you know, what might or might not be beneficial if you're interested in questions. You're welcome to get in touch with me um, individually or, um, or have a conversation now if there's, if there's time. But anyway, um, very much appreciate your attention, the, the invitation to, to talk with you today. I hope I haven't gone way over um, my time and and again, I'm happy to, to take any questions um, if you have them. So thanks very much. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. I have one question. I was reading an article today. Underground ice deposits in warm areas of Mars are raising questions about the red planet's climate change over time. Uh, this is from Purdue. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering, you know, I know our planet's old, Mars is very old. I just wonder at one time if maybe they might have had civilization there and didn't take care of it and the climate change destructed the country, the planet. Yeah, I think there's no indication that that they had civilization that that I'm aware of. I mean, I th there's all that people are really looking for there is some, some signs of possible microbial life in the past. Um, and that may have occurred when there, when Mars had more of an atmosphere. What, what's happened to Mars is it's basically lost a lot of its atmosphere that would have kept it warmer in the past that might have allowed for there to be more liquid water on the surface of the planet. And so um, 
So it may have been that there was microbial life on Mars in the past. Um, and, and that's obviously one of the things that were that these new amazing missions like the, the Perseverance rover um, are, are designed to, to try to look at and store some samples, bring them back to Earth, take a take a real close look and see if maybe there were some microbes there at one point that, that um, we can detect. But, um, you know, I, I don't think that there is any any evidence that sort of uh, that there were anybody like people might have uh, messed with the climate, and, and until we know that there were microbes on the on the planet, it would be tough to to uh, to sort of discuss how life might have affected their their atmosphere in the past. It, um, I know I've read um, sort of some some hypotheses and thoughts about what might have um, led to Mars losing its atmosphere, but I. I don't remember for sure what that was, whether it might be that they have a, something to do with like a less of a um, sort of magnetic field or, or something. Anyway, I, I'm not a um, planetary geologist, so I, <laughs> I should not go too deep into that. But Jerry's get pretty close to Mars from where I can see, so he might be able to just go take a look for us. Uh, yeah, I was there last week. All right. Um, <laughs> I do, have, I, I do have one other question. Uh, what about the big crack in the uh, Antarctic? Have you seen that? What's causing that big crack? Well, um, there's a lot of scientific research going on to try to to try to understand exactly the mechanics for for ice sheets breaking up at the edge of the Antarctic. But and I think a lot of it has to do with um, with the region warming a bit, um, you know, it's it's not warming as dramatically as it is um, at the uh, high northern latitudes where we're losing a lot of sea ice. But um, but my understanding is that it is warming enough to um, to increase the rate of uh, calving of icebergs and some crazy large icebergs in some cases. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's the best I can give you right now. Jeff, how much of the climate change that we've experienced in the last 20, 30 years can be attributed to changes in the sun's energy output? Um, I mean, over time, the sun is gradually putting out more energy, will continue to do so. Um, has that been factored into the calculations as to why the climate is, our climate is warming as rapidly as it is? Yeah, um, virtually none of the change in climate that's happened um, over that time frame has happened because of changes in the sun. And, and we think that actually there's been, if anything, the changes in the sun have led to a very tiny amount of cooling over that time. But, but if we look at the changes in climate that have happened, let's say over the last 50 years, when it's been really dramatic, um, but we could go longer than that. Um, the, that change is, um, people say, you know, and there's a little bit of uh, a range here, but but basically it's 100% or maybe a little bit more than 100% caused by people. Um, so that basically the, all the, the greenhouse gases, the heat trapping gases that we've emitted, we would have expected to warm the planet more than we've actually seen. Um, but at the same time, we're also releasing more aerosols, these little tiny particles that cool the planet. And so that offsets some of the warming from the heat trapping gases, but together they account for um, all the warming that we've seen. Um, and the, um, the variability, the natural variability that we've seen over the last say 50 years um, is predominantly from volcanic eruptions. So big volcanic eruptions like Pinatubo in 1991, um, those eruptions inject a lot of aerosols, these like tiny sulfate particles into the stratosphere. They, they linger there for a long time and that cools the planet for a long period. So you'll see big dips um, for a couple years at a time when there's a really large <coughs> volcanic eruption. That's been the main natural force that's, that's uh, sort of affected climate on that time frame. But it's, um, but it, it's not sort of directional over that time frame. It's, it's you get these occasional um, eruptions and then the atmosphere, the, the uh, forcing from that, as we call it, uh, diminishes. So the, the real directional change over time has been this, this increasingly rapid buildup of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. And, and actually I can show you um, 
let me just real quick go to one slide if I have it. Um, Got to move the chat. There we go. Um, I'm going to, uh, let's see. <laughs> all right, I lost my Zoom window all of a sudden here. Jeff, I have a quick question too. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> um, well, I have geothermal heating and um, I know that helps, but the maintenance on the thing has been um, pretty high in the last three years. I've done several repairs on the thing, but um, I also looked into solar panels to put on my house. And even though it has come down in price, it is still kind of cost prohibitive yeah. to install it. Um, I know our county has has put in a lot of solar fields, and it's um, go ahead. Oh, maybe my sound has stopped for a second. I'm not sure, or maybe you froze for a second. Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, but you can't hear him? No. Okay. Well, I'll come back to his answer then in a minute. Um, yeah, I guess this isn't going to answer. We'll come back to the solar panel question in just a minute. Um, but um, this isn't going to answer the question all that much better. But basically, this, this green line here takes into account changes in the strength of the sun and volcanoes um, and what they would do to the climate over time. Um, the gray line shows the effect of greenhouse gases. The blue line shows the effect of the aerosols that we've been releasing. And the, um, the golden line here um, that sort of nicely goes along with the black to make Purdue colors is the um, expected uh, expected outcome of all of these forcings together. So this yellow line um, is, you know, is a nice match and you, you just need to have all of these factors in, incorporated, but the solar forcings and the, the volcanic forcings that, that cause these dips are really, really tiny in terms of their effect on the change in climate over time. You can see they just hover right near the zero here pretty much this whole time. So anyway, hopefully that answers Jerry's question. Um, stop sharing again. Ms. Morris Mills, one of the questions I always had is what happened to the iceberg age? What caused that to take place? We had the glaciers all over. Sure. That's, and yeah. To go away. That's a great question. I, I love that. That's um, because those are really dramatic shifts in, in our climate that we've seen. And the, the reason for that is that there are um, oscillations that sort of these, these, um, you know, bouncing back and forth of three parts of our orbit, uh, our Earth's orbit around the sun that we understand. Um, and they're on the, these really long time scales of like 100,000 years or, or 23,000 years or 41,000 years. So one of them is that the, the tilt of the Earth goes back and forth a little bit, right? So um, sometimes we're tilted. I just see this thing over my head. I just want to grab it. So this, the, these globes are given a certain tilt right now because our planet is tilted a certain way, right? But it's not always that way. It very slowly goes back and forth like this. And that affects the incoming radiation or the energy that comes in. That's, that's one thing. Another thing is that the, the shape of our orbit is more circular sometimes and more of an ellipse sometimes. So, it, or more of an oval, you know, it goes back and forth from being more circular to more like an oval. That affects the energy coming into our planet too. And then the other thing is that for a given, um, at a given sort of position relative to the sun for our planet, so if the sun is my fist here, um, it, for some periods, uh, well, let's say every 23,000 years, the, the planet goes from being tilted this way um, when it's here, say closest to the sun, um, to being tilted this other, the other direction when it's closest to the sun. Those three things together determine how much of our energy comes at, in near the poles and how much like total energy we have at different times of year. And that's what ends up determining 
whether we have ice sheets, how big the ice sheets get, and how long they persist. So those cycles are still going on, but they're happening on really slow timescales. Again, the, the fastest of them is every 23,000 years that it cycles. And it's the combination of those three factors that, um, that leads to the sorts of fluctuations that we see on the scale of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. But um, you know, what's happening now is happening over decades, not tens of thousands of years. It's happening much, much faster than any of these changes that we've seen before. Is that good, Morris? I guess so. He's on mute, but hopefully that answers yeah. his question. Jeff, quick uh, question, just uh, with the with the wind power. I, I see that there's, in, in Europe, they seem to be using a lot more offshore uh, wind turbines, where here in the United States, we're using land-based wind turbines. Is one more efficient? I mean. Could they take wind turbines, for example, and put them out in Lake Michigan or in the Great Lakes somewhere? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so the, here's the thing: the the winds are much much stronger over the oceans and over the lakes, like Lake Michigan, than they are over land because it's just so smooth. And also, it has to do with the differential in um, sort of rates of heating that happens over the ocean versus over land. But but it's the the windiest places that we can access are off the coasts or you know in the middle of lakes like that and um, and so it's it, it would be ideal to do that and and in fact like off the coast of um, Nantucket off the coast of Massachusetts people tried uh, uh, for a decade two decades nearly now I think to to get in this this installation called Cape Wind because the technology existed to do it and they could make a profit on it they thought but um, People in Nantucket didn't want a wind farm off the shore where they sail their boats or, you know, the people on the coast didn't want to see it or whatever. So that was delayed for, for decades. So the, the, the technology is there and the technology has been rapidly improving as, as these turbines are able to get bigger and bigger. You know, now the size of a football field, the, the diameter of a turbine can be the, the length of a football field. Um, and you know, out there in the in the ocean, um, and, and so that this is happening faster and faster in Europe. But but permitting issues have really kept it from happening in the U.S. It's clearly economical. It, it clearly could be a huge source of power at the um, places where we have big population centers because we have so much of our population near the coasts. So it you know it can be a big part of the solution um, if we can. Um, get to a point where politically those things are those those installations are viable, um, and the, I mean the at the same time the the cost of generating energy from those installations has got gone down and down, and the technology's gotten better for building the sorts of um, installations that that are needed to um, weather those conditions. So I think that it's coming. I think we're on the cusp of a you know huge rollout, um, but um, but it's it's just been slowed down for a variety of reasons at this point. Thanks, Jeff. Anybody else have any questions? I want to, I'm not sure if the person's back who asked the question, but then he got cut off or disappeared. Byron, was that you? No, it was Dennis. He's offline. Okay. Dennis offline now. Okay. Um, well, Jeff, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your information today. I mean, very, very interesting. And I, and I think we could probably go on for a long time. Uh, you know, in fact, I may end up uh, uh, tweeting you or texting you or something here uh, with some other questions, but it is quite interesting to see what we can do to help uh, uh, reduce this, this global warming. And, and really, you know, I, I wonder about all the effects of what it's doing, you know, is it is that the cause of of increased uh, uh, fires and and all of that, those types of things? Uh, yeah, uh, increased hurricanes and and everything else. You know, we, we we hear that, and you just don't know what to believe. But it's interesting to hear it all. Well, yeah, I can say it's pretty clear that it's that it's leading to larger wildfires, um, not necessarily more, but larger. 
And it's pretty clear that it's leading to stronger and wetter hurricanes, not necessarily more hurricanes, but uh, allowing them to strengthen more and carry more water. Um, so the, these, these um, large disasters are influenced by climate change, maybe not in all the ways that you hear about in the media, but, but in, or, or in hyperbolic statements, but in, in, um, in some ways it's, it's pretty clear because you have you know, warmer conditions, they, we just understand the physics of that, they do certain things. Um, like dry out fuel uh, for wildfires, for instance. Um, so it's already affecting these things and, um, and it's only gonna be more so over time and it's gonna be affecting people's health as say mosquitoes come into new regions of Indiana that can carry tropical diseases that weren't here before. There's so many different connections. The implications for crops are not good. Um, it's, yeah, and so I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation over Twitter or email or whatever's useful for you or, or anybody else in the, in the group. And, uh, you know, I think that this, topic lines up really nicely with the Kiwanis mission of children and thinking about the future really and, and, and how to uh, transition them into, um, into the best lives possible. And this is something they're gonna be dealing with um, for the rest of their lives and as, just as we are. So um, again, really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks again. Um, for everybody, the quote of the day and I, I researching here for the quote of the day and it was, uh, Interesting because uh, this one is by Dr. Seuss. And I guess I can say this one. Don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, we will see you all next week. Again, thanks, Jeff. Bye now. So long, everyone.